now behold the Lamb, the precious Lamb of God, born into sin that I may live again, the precious Lamb of God. I, I think sometimes we take for granted where we are. That you are able to stand in this place having been justified, having been declared righteous, having no righteousness of your own. Because he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through faith. In this moment, I would like for you to think, who would I take a bullet for? Take a bullet for your children? If there was an intruder, would you throw your body in front of your children? so that they might live knowing that you will die? Who would you die for? Scripture says that scarcely would one die for a righteous man, but who dies for a renegade? Who, who dies for a prostitute? for a whoremonger, thief. But this Jesus, this Lamb of God, in the picture of the Passover, when the, when the Israelites were instructed to take um, a matchless lamb, a unblemished lamb, and then I want you to kill it. And I want you to catch the blood, and I want you to put it on the doorposts and on the lentils, because the death angel is coming. And that when the death angel sees the blood, he'll pass over you. And every one of you that is under the blood You've already been passed over. But, but it's hard for us to coax from someone who has been passed over even a modicum of praise. It's almost like we forgot where we came from. It's almost as if we forgot what we used to be. Well, not to worry. I'm going to remind you of what you used to be and why you don't deserve to be here. But when you look around and you know that your hands have been made new and your feet have been made new and you don't even talk the way you used to talk, maybe there's a modicum of praise. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the second chapter of the book of Ephesians just going to read a couple of verses. We're going to deal with all of the first 10 in chapter 2, but just read a couple for you. Perhaps the most impactful uh, of these verses. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. If you're there, please say amen. amen. But God, yes, <laughs> being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I want you to look at your neighbor on the left or on the right, And I want you to say, neighbor, neighbor. I should have been, been dead, but God, but God. I, should be on my way to hell. I should be on my way to hell, but God, but God. 
I want to talk to you this morning, just two words, but God, but God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy and your kindness toward us. We pray that you would superintend everything that we say and do here today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to follow along with me because we'll, we'll do a little old-fashioned Bible thumping, but we're not going to run a field. And I want you to see yourself in the message today. I don't want you to look at your neighbor. I don't want you to think of your wayward husband. I don't want you to think of your crazy children. I want you to take a look at you. If we could proclaim the gospel in just two words, those two words would be, but God. If we could declare the vastness of God's unconditional love for sinners in two words, those two words would be, but God. For sinners like you and me who are lost and unable to save ourselves, these words mean everything. There was a time when we were not just indifferent to God, we were dead to any notion of who God is, let alone his love for us. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, we were buried under a debilitating blindness of our own sin. We did not even know how sinful we were, but God. We were enslaved to the illicit passions of our flesh. We were torn between the ravages of a corrupt flesh and a depraved mind, but God. We were enemies of God. We hated him, and we were destined to endure his wrath, but God. Divine intervention. God stepped in to a vacuum that only he could fill. But God has always stepped in. He heals our diseases. He puts food on our tables. He is a shelter in the time of storm. God always has intervened. We have not always given him glory. We have not always thanked him, but he's always been there. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Sometimes it doesn't feel like he's there. I'm sure in North Carolina and South Carolina, it doesn't feel like he's there, but somebody is alive and not dead because God intervened. It was a category one instead of a category four because God intervened. But the ultimate intervention the ultimate invasion of God in our, into our lives is that he brought salvation to sinners. He saved us. When we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, what we see is the tragedy of life without Christ. We see total depravity. But the interesting thing is that we don't see that we are as bad as we could be, but we see that there is no good thing in us, that when you are unsaved, you are incapable of a holy thought. Romans 3.23 reminds us that all have sinned. Look at your neighbor and say, you sin, I sin. Everybody sin and fall short of the glory of God. Every motive and every intention corrupted by sin. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are incapable of a redeeming thought. Because every single thought, every single intention is tainted by sin. You don't have to say amen. 
We are desperately in need of salvation, but it gets worse. We cannot save ourselves. Can you imagine needing a bridge over troubled water? And you come to find out the bridge is out. Every human being on the planet was on a collision course with God's divine justice. We seem to think that we need to be saved from the devil. You need to be saved from God. You don't want to fall into the hands of an angry God. You see, the devil is created. The devil is under control. In the original language, if we consider this text, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is a single thought. And that thought is this. Only God can save. Yes, sir. Only God can save. All right. Only God can save. Flood insurance can't save you. 401k can't save you. The government can't save you. Your two-story house can't save you. Only God can save. As we look at this text, there are four realities that emerge, and I feel like we have to deal with each one of them because they will help us to understand the enormity of God's intervention into our lives. We don't even think about divine intervention. When you breathe in and out, that is divine intervention. Ask someone with COPD. We, we don't even, we, we take breathing for granted until you can't breathe. You take the heartbeat for granted until they resuscitate you in the ICU. There are four realities that I want to deal with. The first is I want to deal with the need for God's intervention. The second is the motive for God's intervention. The third is the blessings of God's intervention. And the fourth, the purpose of God's intervention. So let's deal with the first, the need for God's intervention. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Take your Bibles out. We're going to go through this. Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them too we all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. When we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through, sin, through 10, the bad news of sin is met with the good news of salvation. But I think sometimes we don't, we don't calculate, we don't consider the enormity of sin. This text says that you were dead. This text says you were dead. You weren't sick. You were dead. The church, we like to say, is a hospital where sick people go to get well. That's not what it is. It's a mortuary where dead people go to be born again. You need to get out the notion that you, are, you, you need rehabilitation. You need to be propped up. You need to be changed. We had depraved and despicable minds, and we were condemned. We were on our way to hell. You don't like to hear hell anymore, but we were on our way to hell, but God. 
Y'all better hear me now, because see, somebody in here is not saved. And you know who you are. So, so but why? Why is it so important that, that it's but God? First thing you need to understand about God is that God is holy. God, say that with me, God is holy. Okay. See, but the problem is I can't explain holy. It's one of the most difficult attributes of God to explain. We are made in his image, but we cannot share his holiness. You see, holiness is not only God's moral perfection, it's the essence of his otherness. It's a desecration for you to say the man upstairs. It's a desecration for you to pull God down to your level. God is not like you. And you are not like God. God's holiness means that he is just and that sin must be punished. And brothers and sisters, young people, he does not grade on the curve. Okay, see, y'all need to understand what that means. You need to understand that sin is sin. And until sin becomes utterly sinful, you don't want any part of it. How much, how much E. coli do you need on your lettuce <laughs> before you decide not to eat it? How much bubonic plague do you need on your oatmeal before you decide it's not fit to eat. You see, any sin, yes, however infinitesimally small, is an abhorrence to God. Yes, see, we give ourselves get out of jail free cards. See, I'm not doing what she doing. She all out there. She just, she carrying on. I'm, I'm cool. She's smoking joints every day. I just do one every now and then. I just got one girlfriend. He got four or five. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Illustration I used to use all the time is that I just put just a small amount of doggy do in your bowl of bluebell. Would you just lap it up? You're thinking, you're thinking, ooh! Well, every time God looks at a sinner that's not covered by the blood, he says, ooh! He's holy. And not only is he holy, he's sovereign. He is not God if he's not sovereign. He does what he wants, when he wants, and with whomever he wants. He can bring a storm. He can stop a storm. He can let you get sick. He can heal you. And so what you start, better start doing is you better start trying to figure out what God is trying to do in your life. God maybe can do more with you sick than he can with you well. If, if, be, if getting sick will get you saved, you better get sick. <sighs> Y'all not with me. Sin is not the sinner's problem. God is the sinner's problem. We need to be saved from a holy and just, just God that hates sin in any form. Yes, sir. See, now I, know, I know a lot of you here skating. You don't do much cheating on your taxes, just a little. You don't watch much pornography, just a little. Y'all better pray with me. You have to understand that God was the sinner's problem, but he chose to become the sinner's solution. 
What God demanded, he personally supplied. God saved us from himself. God stepped in front of the bullet that was intended for you, and he took it. When was the last time you said, thank you, Jesus, for saving me? We rejected God in every aspect of his character, but God intervened. We were hopeless, but God. I'm kind of quiet. Remember I told you that the bad news is that you could not save yourself? The good news is you don't have to. He's already arranged for you to be saved. Not by works of righteousness which you have done, but by his mercy he saved you by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. But see, some of us, some of us think we can be mean and still be saved. One of, the th- one of the things I struggle with is forgiveness. I struggle with forgiveness. Because if somebody done messed over you, it's hard to let them off the hook. You know what I'm saying? If you've got a husband who's cheated on you or a wife who's cheated on you or somebody who put their hand on you and they weren't supposed to, you struggle with that. But all you have to realize is all the stuff you have been forgiven of. And, and, and to think about, you can't get your forgiveness if you are not willing to give it. Oh, so you say, Pastor, I'm about to think about that. All right. <laughs> Go ahead and think about it. But see, the thing is that you can't take poison and expect somebody else to die. And when you refuse forgiveness, you are taking the poison. You can't have a decent life. It's a quieter group than I expected. You you don't just see the need for his intervention. You see the motive for his intervention. What is that? Verse 4. It says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Skip down to verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Scripture assures us that God is rich in mercy. The the King James Version says, plenteous in mercy. Psalm 103.8 says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous. Don't you like that word? See, see, if I'm sitting down and they serve in me um, dessert, I want plenteous. (laughs) Get the picture? And so that's the kind of mercy God gives you, a a, a double helping. You know, you say, but can you put a little more up there? Then you put a triple help. See, mercy ministers to misery. Yes, sir. The more hurt you have, the more mercy you receive. And so some of you who are hurting, you don't even know how high he is lifting you up. You don't even know what he is delivering you from because mercy ministers to misery. But that's not the key here. It says in Titus 3, 5, it says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but but according to his mercy, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, 
our Savior. God loves us even though we are not worthy of his love. You know, it's like loving your East Texas cousin. (laughs) You say, they don't deserve it. They mess up your money. They're always begging. And even when they get it, you know, they're buying them strange cigarettes. You know, so they don't deserve it. But isn't it amazing that God can love even when we don't deserve it? Think about it. The God who spoke the world into existence loves you. The God who speaks and storms are quiet loves you. The God who heals diseases, who gives sight to the blind, who raises the dead loves you. Now, to me, that's a big deal. Have you ever had a situation where someone promised to love you, but when they found out your history, when they found out what you were really like, they decided to take back their love, kind of put it in the layaway. (laughs) But God, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Imagine someone having a dossier on you. They know everybody you've been around, that you've been with, They know every lie you told. They know every false word, every cuss word. They know you in and out. You know, that kind of gives me an idea that maybe when we start pre-marriage counseling, what we need to do is have each of the couples, each of the couples prepare a dossier on each other. (laughs) And go back to when you were kindergarten and, t- and say, okay, I'm going to tell you all about me now. Yes, so, so that when this come up, you all ready? No. See, because a lot of marriages end because people say, I, I never would have thought you'd have been like that. I never would have thought you'd have said that to me. I never would have thought you have, would have done But you are marrying a sinner. Yes. With a track record yes, sir. of sinning. Yes, sir. So even if you don't know it, it's there. <laughs> Everything that you can imagine is probably there. Isn't it, Miss Adele? We all got some stuff down there. We don't want people to know. But can you imagine the God of the universe already knows and he loves you anyway? That's a huge deal. We talk about know God and make him known. Well, the God that we're talking about knowing already has peeped your whole card. You know how you can pretend to other folk you this and that? All that and a bag of chips. He knows that your chip bag is empty. You cannot pretend with God, and he loves you anyway. Ooh, that's a big deal. That's that's a shout right there, boy. See, I got some stuff. Just me and him, though, you know, me and him. I can't tell y'all, boy. I'll put a brother out of the pulpit. Okay, I'm going to go to the blessings of divine intervention, and that's verses um, 5 and 6. It says, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. The real blessing in divine intervention is that God did what only God could do. You and I were dead. We were beyond human intervention. 
But God intervened. You did not choose him. Yes, sir. He chose you. And not because you are a number one draft choice. Can I get a witness? He didn't choose you because you were a star in college. He chose you because you are at best a walk-on. And he's giving you a spot on the taxi squad. But a spot on the taxi squad of Jesus is better than being in the big house with somebody else. Can I get a witness? I, sometimes I wonder what my house is going to look like. It, it, I see, in, I see in the, they change the translations, change it, says in, in his house are many dwelling places. I, well, I prefer the King James on this. He says, mansion. I want my mansion. I'm putting up with all this stuff down here. I want a big house. Somebody listening to me, you have to understand God picked you knowing everything there is to know about you, knowing what you were going to do today, knowing what you're going to do tomorrow. He did not disqualify you because of what you did, but he didn't give you any credit either. So any of you who are looking down your nose at the rest of us, okay, that's like one dirt bag saying to another dirt bag, look at how dirty you are. You ain't special. God made you special. I'm getting excited now. Because, see, I see myself. I see my, the, the distinguishing thing about me is that God chose me. Yes, see, some of y'all would put me out. See, if you knew my story, you might put me out. But I'm in now. When, when we, what we got from God is he saved us. He gave us a new life and then he seated us with Christ. In the heavenly places. Pastor, what in the world does this mean? Well, a um, um, couple of lessons from now we're going to talk about this. Because we're going to talk about the spiritual realm and spiritual warfare. See, because what you don't want is you don't want to look around and see who's sitting next to you. Okay? Because, you know, the devil and his boys come to church. Yes, sir. They, they in here now. And, and if, you could, if, the, if you could just pull back the veil and see who's in here, you would run out. But what he did is he said, I'm going to seat you in the heavenly realms with Christ. So you were right next to, see, he's seated next to the Father, and you're sitting yes, right next to him. You say, but Pastor, but I'm sitting here in, in, in Amity, in Richardson. How can I be seated in, in the heavenly realm if I'm in here trying to deal with these folks at Amity? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> see, because the spirit man is not bound by places or time. We are eternal beings. Yes, sir. And we transcend all of that. Yes, and so we are with Christ. And when we identify with him, we have some of the power that yes, he sir. has. But see, we don't always exercise our power. What you talking about, Pastor? Well, I'm talking about all you people who say God is my co-pilot. You know what that means? That means you driving. And that's what's wrong with your life is that you are driving instead of turning it over to the one who's able to do more than we could ever ask or think.
we are no longer tied to the first Adam. In his sin and condemnation, we are now tied to the second Adam in his glory. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, this is a positional reality. This is a positional reality. What do you mean, Pastor? Positional reality. When you marry someone, regardless to how you get treated, you are positionally married. Nothing you can do about that. You may not feel married. You may not appreciate being married, but you are married. See, so I am, I am seated with Christ. And only when I let you bring me down to where you are do I have to deal with the mess. You see, how do you avoid it? Someone says something to you. I, I saw a Facebook post. There was, a, there was a Caucasian gentleman. I'm using the term gentleman loosely. Okay? And he had his, his hands handcuffed behind him. And he's sitting on the curb, and there was an African-American female officer, and he was yelling at her, and he was saying, inward, 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 and then he paused, and he said again, inward, inward, inward. You know what she was doing? <laughs> she didn't move. You see, when you are in the heavenly realm, they can call you a name. But you don't have to respond because that's not your name anymore. You can say whatever you want about me. It's just, we talk about sticks and stones may break my bone, the word can... You, you do let words hurt. And sometimes you will stop being friends with people because of what they said. Yes, sir. Well, you have to realize that we are still sinners. We are still crazy. We still have messed up minds. And sometimes we get in that, that you, 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 don't, you ain't always seated at the right hand of the Father unless you consider yourself. I, I, got, to, I got to quit. It's, what time is it? It's 11.30. Okay. One of the things that I say to people who get married, using the marriage in a marriage illustration again, but when I pronounce that they are husband and wife, I don't do anything for them. They, they, they are the same as when they came in. They, they, I, just because I say, y'all married. Okay, that doesn't, that doesn't do it. So what does it, pastor? Because they go out and act married. They go home together. They set up house. And they start treating each other like husband and wife. They consider themselves yes, married. What if you considered yourself a Christian? Would you still be going to where you go now, where you're going to go after, after church? Would, would, you, would, you, would you still keep your same wardrobe? <laughs> the, the, the young people, the children are studying uh, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine that men will see your good works, but give God the glory. You have to consider yourself as chained. That's the difference between being yes, positionally. Sir. See, now, 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 wait, 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 wait. Okay, right now we are positionally seated. But when he comes back, we're going to go from positionally to presently. We're going to be, I can't wait, at my house. He's bringing a horse for me, too. We're going to ride in the Dodge. <laughs> and he's going to have down one side, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's not going to ride in on no donkey, and I'm going to be right with him. 
Can I get a witness? Seated positionally. But he's coming back. And then I already kind of tipped my hand. The purpose for divine intervention we find in verses 6 and 7. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing richness of his grace and kindness toward us. When God intervenes to save us, he leaves us in this world as trophies of his grace. He leaves us here as living, breathing letters of his love for the lost. Every redeemed saint is a testimony to the power of God to change the lives of sinners. Do you know what that means? If you keep on doing what you were doing before you got saved, God may have to take that piece of paper and crumble it up and start again because you're not repping. Everywhere you go. And my wife reminds me of this. Pastor Smith. I I hate that name. (laughs) Because it's a reminder of how I'm supposed to conduct myself. What is your name? Yes, sir. God commands us to let our lights shine. He commands us to love people. We say it, we say it every Sunday. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Why? Because all men will know that you are my disciples by what? By the way you sing in the choir. By the way you serve on the usher. By the way that you help with the hospitality. No! It's how you love your unruly neighbor. How you... Love your problematic yes, boss sir. the way you love your sibling yes, who took all the money. Yes, <laughs> but God. But God. You don't want to know my story? I was lost in sin. I didn't even know I was lost. But God, I was trapped in the darkness of my own mind. But God, I was separated from God and I was headed to hell. But God, I was under the control of Satan and I was a prisoner to my own passions. But God stepped in. I was dead. I was deceived. I was depraved. I was doomed. But God. And the marvelous thing is I might not be what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. See, see that? You can, see, how, how do I know? You see, you can ask people who knew me when. See, see that, a little barometer this week. Go to some of your old friends. Ask them if they see any change in your life. Ask them if you seem like you are the same person that you used to be. I have I have a painting that was done for me years ago. I'm done. Done for me years ago. It's in my hobby room upstairs. It's a, it's a portrait of, of me. I had hair. 
And, and I was a fairly good-looking guy. <laughs> and it used to hang in our old building over on uh, Sherman. Sherman. It, it started in Centennial, but then we moved it over to Sherman, right by the door. Great big picture of Pastor Les Smith. And I thought, hmm, brother got it going on. (laughs) And I was standing next to the picture one day. There was a guy who was looking at the picture. And I was waiting to hear his comment, waiting to hear his compliment. You know what he said? He said, who was the artist? He said, this is an incredible piece of work. Who was the artist? It dawned on me that the picture looked the way it did because of the artist. Yes, sir. Mm. You... I wonder who is going to look at you and your life and how you treat people and how you talk and how you demonstrate and that they're going to say, my God, who was the artist? Who was it that changed your life? Who was it? that made you into the person that you are now. Who was the artist? Stop taking credit for what God has done in your life. You didn't make up your mind to follow Jesus. You were dead in trespasses and sins. And by his mercy, he saved you by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. But you had to come to the place where you realized you were a mess. Yes, sir. I was a mess. Amen. Ooh, but I'm not there anymore. And I'm speaking to somebody here. And you, and you can't come until you realize you're a mess. Yes, sir. If you think you just need rehabilitation, you can't be saved. If you think you just need to tweak your life, you need to stop cussing or stop going some of the places. If that's what you think, you can't be saved. But if you realize I'm helpless, yes, sir. I cannot save myself, but thank God I don't have to. He went to the cross. He bled. He died. He took a bullet for you. And all he asks is that you agree with him about his assessment of you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That you need a savior. And today is a mighty good day to get saved. Yes, sir. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, you and you know, you know that you don't know him. Yes, sir. You're ready. You're ready. You're ready for a change in your life that can only come through the divine intervention of God himself. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give you a chance to get up and say, I know I'm a mess. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But based on what you've told me, there is someone who can clean up the mess. Yes, sir. There is someone who can change my life. Let's pray. Father... I I know that someone here who has heard today, they just need to respond. They know the situation they are in. They know they need a Savior. And now they know that only you can save. And so I pray that they won't sit in their seats, that they will get up and they will say, Pastor Smith, I know that I need a Savior. And I know that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. And so I want to put my trust in him today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.